Excellent. Okay, uh, just to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional owners of the lands that I live and work on and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples past and present. Literary scholars Santani Das and Kate McLaughlin, in the introduction to their recent edited collection, The First World War Literature, Culture, Modernity 2018, talk about how the First World War couldn't be made sense of. It remained unknowable because incomprehensible. And scholars have long engaged with this problem of to what extent language can capture the experience of war, many concluding that language always falls short of being able to fully convey what it means. Nevertheless, the language of war has in a variety of ways proved to be a source of ongoing fascination. One particular type of war related publication has remained largely unanalyzed in the scholarship. And this is the war dictionary, by which I mean collections of war slang and language and service slang generated during the war, sorry, during war. In my paper today, I hope to tackle the broad idea of the war dictionary as a type of genre of publication. And due to time constraints, um, I can only mention a few publications across each war, but all of this forms part of a longer article that I'm currently working on. So I'm kind of trying out a few ideas in this paper. By providing an overview of dictionaries um, that are produced um, from the First World War and the Vietnam War, which are the two wars that I'm gonna focus on today, across several English, produced from several English speaking countries. I hope to identify why these kinds of dictionaries are compiled and published, the extent to which they are the products of those who experience war or not, the ways in which they seek to convey or not an understanding of war, and finally say something about their reception where that information is available. Well, those are the aims of my broader paper. I'm probably only gonna be able to touch on those very briefly um, today. One thing I'd just like to note um, is it's my per perception so far that the greater number of studies um, exist for the language of the First World War and the Vietnam War by comparison to the Second World War. And this is something that's quite interesting to me. Um, I'm not really gonna to touch on Second World War dictionaries much in this paper, um, even though um, certainly there was a great deal of commentary at the time, like during the Second World War about the slang being generated, not a lot of these um, commentaries seem to translate to a large number of post-war dictionary publications. And I speculate very generally that maybe the First World War and the Vietnam War both involved a sense of unknowability, a sense that you had to be there to really understand what the war was like. That unknowability led, or perceived unknowability, led to a perceived gulf between the home and front that was not considered to be easily bridged. And as I'll talk about, a number of these dictionaries are framed in terms of um, being created in order to translate um, the language of the war and the experience of the war to those at home, perhaps something that wasn't felt as strongly with the Second World War. So as I just mentioned, um, there's during the wars themselves, there's a great deal of commentary about the nature of language, how it's changing, how wars are lexically productive, the technologies of war, the impacts of the war on society, um, particularly for the First and Second World Wars, the experience of civilians who enlist or are drafted into the war rather than professional army. All of this has served to shape an extensive English language lexicon of war, which is also commented on. So people are very conscious of this um, lexical um, creativity and production during wartime. During the wars themselves, glossaries were published in venues such as newspapers, scholarly journal, journals, and even soldier magazines. Um, I'm imagining, just talk, thinking about mill blogs, maybe um, you know, the on, online world has become um, a great place for um, recording the glossaries and language of the more recent conflicts. Um, words were collected by lexicographers and have been since the First World War. Um, there was a great deal of discussion in the press more generally about language, the nature of slang, the nature of the language that was being produced. And this consciousness of language meant um, perhaps that dictionaries, um, the production of, of book dictionaries was perhaps inevitable. 
But as I'll also talk about, the dictionary making impulse was also fundamentally about documenting, recording, witnessing the experience of war. So I've divided up my um, consideration of these types of dictionaries um, into different categories. And the first of these um, that I'm dealing with here are the dictionaries from first, what I call from first hand experience of war. So these are dictionaries that are compiled by veterans themselves um, or people or from contributions from um, veterans. Veterans. So um, those who have experienced war firsthand play an important role in the documentation of wartime language. So Australia um, is uh, one of the first countries to produce um, a dictionary in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Um, in 1919, W.H. Downing's Digger Dialects appeared, um, published by Melbourne publisher Lobian. Um, Downing had enlisted in 1915, served on the Western Front. Um, and his book um, was an extraordinary record of the language of the war. His preface to the dictionary commented that the glossary, quote, represents the sweat of the AIF striving. It is a byproduct of the collective imagination of the AIF. He also wrote that he saw the language of the soldiers um, that he had recorded as being distinctive, quote, it savors of a new national type. Um, so Downing's book represents an effort not just to document the language of his war and his wartime experience, but also to invest that language with ideas of national identity. So I think it's really interesting that he frames it in these nationalistic terms, um, something not a lot of these traditions do. Many of the reviews of Digger Dialects at the time um, when it came out mentioned how the soldiers had both displayed quote, the Australian sense of humour, inventiveness and mental picturesqueness in their language, as well as contributed to Australian lexicon. The contemporary reception to Downing also touched on another theme that relates to why these kinds of dictionaries were archived and how they are generally received. The Sydney Morning Herald review of Downing stated that, quote, the soldier has come home full of strange oaths and curious terms of speech. However, Mr Downing has taken pity on the civilian's ignorance and compiled Digger Dialects. Here the reviewer touches on this key function that dictionaries have, or were at least intended to have by their authors and editors, to interpret the language of the war for those on the home front, and in the process tell those on the home front something about their experiences. Oh, Amanda, um, I think you just put a paper in front of your microphone, and so... Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. I don't have enough of space on this desk at home. Um, so, sorry, did you miss out on the last paragraph? Or could you hear it? Oh, we could catch it. There was just rustling on top of it. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, so the next one I'll talk about is John Brophy and Eric Partridge's Songs and Slang of the British Soldier 1914-18, which appeared in 1930. And I've spoken um, at a Vizan's conference about Brophy and Partridge at length before. This is a really interesting text because it evolved. Um, there's um, three editions in 1930, another edition in the 1960s, another edition in the 2000s. And I talked quite a bit about the differences between these editions. I'm not gonna revisit that obviously, but I do wanna just make a couple of comments about these texts. Um, both this text, both editors were war, war veterans. Brophy served with the British Army. Partridge served with the AIF. He was a New Zealander who served with the AIF and who then went to live in the UK and became a slang lexicographer. During the interwar period, um, Brophy had become a pacifist. And as I talked about at length in my previous Bizan's paper, this colored the glosses for various entries in songs and slang, and those were later paired back. So here's just an example, if you're interested to have a look, this is the entry for San Ferry Ann. And you can see there's an extensive commentary and quite a, an ironic and cynical um, commentary um, attached to that entry. So the introduction to songs and slang was lengthy um, and touched on a number of reasons for compiling uh, the book. They stated that the collection was to be not a, not a mere dictionary list, but a record by glimpses of the British soldiers' spirit and life in the years 1914-18. And Partridge also wrote elsewhere that working on this text had been a means of helping to, quote, get the war out of my system. So it had a cathartic effect, which I think is really interesting as well. Both of these men also um, participated in British literary culture in the period. So they write extensively um, um, both wrote novels, both wrote um, essays, um, and I think Songs and Slang um, very much belongs to a kind of literary moment, the war books boom um, at the end of the 1920s, early 1930s, that was really about reworking um, the memory of the war. 
And war dictionaries more generally, um, I would argue, can function as a site of memory and a site of reworking memory. For veterans, they could be a way of working through and arguably containing their experiences, but could also help to construct and mediate the veteran identity. So looking at Vietnam, I've so far only identified one Vietnam dictionary compiled by someone who had direct experience serving in the war. And this is also an Australian text. So this is Bruce Picken, uh, Bruce Picken's dictionary, Vietnam Diggers Language. So Picken served in the Australian Army, um, undertook his tour of duty in 1971. This book was published in 2006, so quite a long time after the fact, and was a response, he explains, to reading lots of books about Vietnam that, include, that included lots of abbreviations and acronyms that he believed were rarely explained. And he decided that the ideal solution to this problem would be to compile a book of slang, acronyms, terms and jargon, which could be read as a book in its own right or used in conjunction with other publications of the Vietnam War era. Pickens slang I'm that's left in your session. Yep. Pickens slang collection includes a full range of terms, including terms such as offensive language. So it's a lot more graphic by comparison to the earlier ones, which are, are self-censored. References to sex, military terminology and combat terms. And the book was also supplemented with documents, facts about the war and the inclusion of the text of the song, I Was Only 19. So the second category, which I think is um, the really another really interesting category of war dictionaries that are produced, these are what I call, at the moment I'm just calling it the legacy dictionary, I'm not sure I haven't come up with a better um, title, but these are essentially dictionaries that were compiled by those who have some relationship to war through, for example, working with veterans, but they're not people who have direct experience of that war. And here are two of these. And interestingly, this is a category that seems to be largely the Vietnam, uh, related to the Vietnam War. And interestingly, both of these are compiled by women. So Linda Reinberg's In the Field, The Language of the Vietnam War was published in 1991. Um, she mentions a, she was a psychologist specializing in PTSD and had done research um, with families of Vietnam veterans. Um, she cites a couple of reasons for writing the book. One was to, like Picken, interpret the large number of books that were being published on the war. But she also writes that she wanted to uh, record the colourful language and terms that servicemen and women used during the Vietnam War. She didn't want it to, quote, become extinct. Um, Sharon Lightholder's um, 550 page book, Vietnam, the War Zone Dictionary in Their Own Words, um, is another interesting publication, comes out in 2016. Lightholder is a writer of historical fiction, but she grew up in a US military family and worked as a probation officer with Vietnam veterans in the 19, early 1970s. And this is just from her personal blog, um, author blog, um, where she talks about her motivations and, and the process of writing this book. So you can read that for yourself because I don't have time to read it out. But you can see there that she talks both about her own um, relationship to the military, but also her experience working with Vietnam vets, compiling a small glossary, which I'll ultimately evolved into a much larger um, collection. And it is a very hefty um, publication. So these are kind of an interesting um, subgenre, if you like, within these war dictionaries um, that are really about a kind of personal connection um, to war. So I've got just another couple of categories that I'll just very briefly mention here. One is what I call um, at the moment the Popular Heritage Dictionary. And these are these kinds of um, dictionaries. Um, I suppose they often are aimed, uh, well, they're aimed at a broad audience, but perhaps also aimed to be sort of, they kind of fall slightly into that kind of gift um, category. Often done, um, uh, compiled by, by serious scholars. So Peter, Bo Peter Doyle and Julian Walker are both serious scholars um, of the First World War. But this book um, with cartoons and images um, very much aimed at a general audience. Um, Christopher Moore's Roger Sausage and Whippet. I mean, you can see where it's sort of aiming itself. Um, so they represent, I guess, a continuing fascination with war, um, a, you know, a kind of popular, a popular interest in language. Um, perhaps also reflect this um, commercialization um, of publishing around war and the memory boom. So this ongoing um, reworking of the war in popular culture. 
we can perhaps also interpret them as vectors of, of what Ross Wilson um, talks about as intangible heritage. And he's talked about the persistence of war language in British public discourse as a form of intangible heritage. And maybe these dictionaries can fall into that category. And finally, just uh, talking about scholarly dictionary, and that sort of crosses over into that popular dictionary, really. Um, my own book over there, Furfies and Whizbangs, um, serious scholarly um, book, but aimed, uh, you know, we published it in 2015 in the hopes of, of gaining um, an, an audience um, for the Anzac centenary. Um, Tom Dalzell's Vietnam War Slang, a dictionary on historical principles published by Routledge. Um, they sort of cross over into that popular dictionary, um, commercialization of war, part of the memory boom, but also driven by scholarly imperatives, um, obviously aiming to, to, to do serious lexical or linguistic study, um, as well as contributing to scholarly understandings of the experience of war. So just to conclude, um, I hope I've, I've demonstrated that I think more dictionaries are texts worthy of studying. I think they can tell us a lot um, about the way in which the memory of war is worked and reworked. And of course, for dictionaries that are firsthand um, experienced dictionaries, I think they can also tell us something about the way in which those authors are trying to um, translate, contain, mediate their experiences. The production, compilation, publication and reception of these dictionaries, I think, can all help to illuminate the role of the war dictionary in um, shaping our understanding of the experience of war. So thank you. I'll end there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that um, really rich and insightful and, and um, a detailed look at, uh, at, at a bunch of different texts that I don't know very much about at all. Uh, and I was really interested to hear you use those, uh, those concepts of um, sites of memory and we work, work reworking memory, which really draws the, the link to the previous paper as well. Um, it, I, yeah, there, uh, if you've got any questions, audience, please do put them in the Q&A um, chat function. There are a couple of questions. So um, Veronique asks, what about phrase books? Were some slang language in these booklets? Yeah, I mean, phrase books is interesting. And I, I do have a little collection of those as well. I think they sort of fall into a slightly um, different um, category of what I'm trying to do with this particular um, uh, project, which is really to look at um, the dictionaries that are published relating directly to the language of the war. But it is something that I am interested in and have been thinking about as well, although they'll probably be um, kind of separate studies. Um, I think what is interesting, um, and some, some of this has been written about, certainly about British um, dictionaries from the First World War, um, is the way in which it some of the dictionaries that are produced during the war as phrase books for soldiers who were going over to serve in France, that it often, um, there, there's some interesting and quite telling um, instructions given to, to soldiers, you know, translating words around how they might interact with civilians, um, you know, understanding the words for surrender, all of these kinds of things. And, and there's an interesting chapter um, in Julian Walker and Christophe de Klerk's um, the, the you know those you've published Veronique in, in one of them and I'm not sure if it's the one you published in or the other one that they did um, but there's a really interesting chapter that, that deals with that. And Peter Krauss our previous speaker asked us as an enormously interesting and important topic thanks so much Amanda for a terrific presentation I wonder what role the civilian versus military divide plays in the development of lexicons dictionaries and of wartime language my suspicion he says is that such dictionaries are necessary because militaries can be echo chambers and subcultures in their own right often at odds with civilian communities but I would be curious about your thoughts yeah I mean that's a great question Peter thank you um yeah I mean look one of the things that I, I will be dealing with is the sort of ongoing, I guess, militarization of the slang and jargon of the war as it goes, um, goes on. And certainly that seems to be very much the case um, increasingly with Vietnam, where there's a lot more talk about acronyms and jargon and the need to kind of explain that. As I was saying with um, a couple of them kind of framing the reason for putting, um, creating the dictionary is about translating that kind of language. So whereas the earlier ones are more about recording um, a kind of slang as a kind of monument, as it were, to these veterans and the kind of language that they used. Um, even though there is a translation kind of function and they do talk about that, it is, does seem to be more about memorialising that slang before it 
passes on. Whereas with Vietnam, and I think also some of the collections of um, more recent slang, a lot of them are online, although there is one dictionary, Embrace the Suck, um, for um, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it's often about explaining the jargon and acronyms are just so much more um, a part of it as time goes on. And so, yes, that is a much more closed kind of world rather than a translation um, function, if you like. So thank you. Another question is, were there any New Zealand dictionaries produced that you know of? Uh, I haven't even come across any. I've got some Canadian ones. I'm talking about the Commonwealth, um, but I don't. If you know any, uh, if anyone knows any, I'd be, I'd, I mean, I'm still tracking um, ones down. So I'd be very interested to, to find out, but I haven't come across any that I can think of. And Susan asks, uh, has any work, uh, any comparative work been done around the language used in official army manuals and unofficial slang used by the troops? Oh, that's an interesting um, question. Uh, I don't know. Um, Julian Walker's recently written a really interesting book called Words, I think it's called Words and the War, about the First World War and talks about the many different aspects about language during the war. Um, I don't, he certainly talks about the unofficial slang. I can't remember if he talks about the official army manuals. Um, but that's a really interesting question and something, you know, I'm, I've sort of got a, a broader interest in, in war and language. And that's a, a question I will take note of and, um, you know, definitely will think about some more. So thank you for that question. And uh, finally, I wondered if there's a much of a crossover between these dictionaries and your current newly published book on swear words. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, uh, I do talk a little bit about both uh, Downing's Digger Dialects because it was actually quite in interestingly quite graphic for the time. So he did include quite a few um, rude words, shall we say, even if they were slightly disguised. So FFF and FA and <laughs> um, a few others. And um, yeah, so there's definitely a crossover. And I mean, again, as I said the uh, in my paper, um, the earlier ones, there's certainly a level of censorship and self-censorship in play, even though they probably helped to push the boundaries a little bit in terms of acceptable um, language, but certainly, um, you know, the Vietnam War dictionaries are, you know, pretty horrific in some ways to, to, to be looking at, you know, when you read those, um, the racist and um, the sexual imagery in, in some of that language can be quite confronting.